Thank you all so much for joining. It is uh, really amazing to be talking to live human faces instead of to a dismal void of Zoom backgrounds. Um, so thank you for joining. My name is Mary Claire Thompson. I am a data engineer at Duke University. Today I'm going to be talking about a pipeline migration that I worked on as part of a larger project uh, last year. And um, I think it's a really interesting uh, project. It was actually the first time that I had worked on a pipeline migration, so something that was originally built on premises and then moved into the cloud. Um, so yeah, we learned a lot of really good stuff and I'm excited to share what we learned with you. And the clicker may not be working anymore. So cool. There we go. So let me give you a bit of background about the problem and about Duke. Um, Duke has traditionally been pretty slow to move into the cloud. In fact, when I started at Duke shortly before the beginning of the pandemic, I would say that most of our resources were actually on premises, including a Spark cluster that I'm going to be talking about today. And I would say that the reasons for the hesitance uh, were varied, there were actually quite a few. Um, maybe one of the big components of the hesitance is the fact that we have um, both a lot of FERPA protected data as well as much HIPAA protected data, so that's fun. Fortunately, I don't have to worry about uh, protected data for the purposes of this talk, so that's helpful. Um, of course, the beginning of the pandemic really pushed it changed everything, and it pushed us to reconsider the decision to be on-prem, and we started transitioning into the cloud. So part of that transition was a, um, as part of that transition, we did decide to uh, get rid of the Spark uh, cluster that we were handling on-premises. And we found out at the end of 2020 that that Spark cluster was going away. And by going away, I mean physically leaving our data center. We had a date in 2021 where it was getting ripped out, and that's how on-premises we were. So we had a number of pipelines that were handled by this smart cluster, and we needed to transition them, to migrate them into the cloud. Specifically, wow, all of those clicks that I made that didn't do anything just happened all at once, so that's cool. All right, so really fun. You get to, that's a preview of what's coming. Um, so we chose to migrate those pipelines into the cloud, specifically into Azure, which is our cloud provider. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be discussing the first pipeline that we worked on. Um, I'm gonna call it the Stinger Logs pipeline. That is maybe a bit of a, um, it's not quite accurate because there are actually three feeds in this pipeline, and so there are technically three pipelines, but they're very similar. So I'm just gonna call it one thing. So what is Stinger, you might want to know? Well, it is a really cool project that uh, is in-house at Duke. It started at Duke. Stinger stands for the Shared Threat Intelligence for Network Gatekeeping and Automated Response. And this is a this guy's not working. This is a partnership among universities that allows us to share information on network attacks. The data that we get from Stinger is used for analytics reporting as well as machine learning. And one thing that's important to note about this pipeline is that the data that we get from it are not large. In fact, the last time I checked, um, we were only getting about 162 megabytes per day of shared data. So that's really small, but in aggregate over the course of this project, we do have a decent amount of data. And in addition, the size really uh, of the data is really not in proportion to the importance of this data for us. Because again, we're using it for ML, uh, we're using it for a lot of shared information among these partner universities. The analysts at Duke specifically need timely access to some lightly processed raw data, preferably within a few hours, and then day-level aggregations. So 
I grabbed a sample log from one of our Stinger feeds and threw it up here. This is actually not the entire log. I had to cut it down because I wanted you to be able to see at least some of it. Um, as you're looking over the log and sort of parsing what's there, I'll tell you just a bit more about Stinger. Stinger is a collection of honeypots. If you don't know what that is, it's essentially a fake endpoint. Um, attackers will access that fake endpoint, think that they have gained access to one of our servers, and they'll try running commands. And Stinger allows us to grab information about what the attackers are doing. And again, the information that we glean this way is then used for ML and reporting. Some interesting things that you may or may not be able to see up here. Um, you can see uh, under the source IP field where that attack came from. And you can also see a command that the attacker ran once they accessed the honeypot. That's about uh, close to halfway down under the command field. It says lscpu pipe grep model. So it's good stuff. We get a lot of good information out of this pipeline. So in making this migration, we needed to replicate several things. We needed to be able to ingest the logs and do some processing. This included some field extractions, uh, very minor formatting, and then post hoc aggregation. So after the fact, we really just use day level aggregations. Obviously, we needed storage and um, the terms of our grant for this project require us to store the logs for several years. I believe it's three years. So we needed to keep it for a while, both the cleaned raw data and those aggregated views. And then the last thing that we needed was an analytics platform with access to the underlying data. As I was starting off on this project, um, we did get a few requests from the architects of the original pipeline, as well as from the, um, the data scientists who we work with on this project. Um, one request was that it would be easy for analysts to search the raw data by a timestamp. So put a timestamp on the, uh, the actual log file name. And then we wanted to have a Spark cluster for our analysts. Again, even though it's a relatively small amount of data, um, in aggregate, over the course of the project, we get a decent amount of data. And we also just wanted to ease the transition for our analysts. They were moving, they were moving their analyses from a local setup to something in the cloud. So we wanted to ease that transition as much as we could. They were used to using Jupyter Notebooks, so preferably we wanted Jupyter Notebooks or another notebook solution. And also, preferably, we wanted them to be able to recycle the code that they already had, which was Spark code. So I'm gonna give you a rundown of the original pipeline. Stinger is, again, this project that is gathering these logs. Stinger wrote the logs to a server where FileBeats picked them up, forwarded them to Logstash. Logstash wrote them to HDFS. And then again, we had a Spark job on our Spark cluster set up that would perform the field extractions, the, raw, the cleaning of the raw data that needed to happen, and then write those cleaned logs back to HDFS. Spark also handled the, uh, those day-level aggregations. And then the final component was Jupyter Notebooks set up with access both to the Spark cluster uh, for purposes of computational abilities as well as obviously to the raw data. The logstash to HDFS step wrote the data out as JSON, and it would write a file per minute regardless of the timestamp on the data. So um, there's a distinction to be made here. 
Um, the timestamp at which the data was generated may not be, in, in fact, probably wasn't the same as when we see the log. So um, we wanted to be careful to parse the timestamp eventually on the actual log and uh, apply that to the file name. But in this first step, the data were just written straight out to a single file per minute that just got appended to. And then Spark came in, the Spark job, and did rewrites. So it did these, this was basically just like a five minute job, ran every five minutes, and it performed the cleaning, uh, any field extractions that needed to happen, and wrote the final files out in Parquet format. And as I mentioned, the original pipeline uh, had file names that were based on the logged timestamp. This was down to a five minute level, so um, the very detailed timestamp you see on here is an example of what that might have looked like. I didn't have a lot of insight into the original pipeline. Um, it wasn't really my domain. But I found out sort of throughout the process um, some problems with the, original, uh, with the original pipeline, both by talking to the original architect as well as by uh, poking around and realizing some issues. So one thing that came to be a problem was that in, on this on-premises pipeline, they were like, we're gonna go with Parquet. And that's cool and all, but it was a decision that they made before they fully fleshed out the pipeline. And it turned out that uh, none of the tools in the rest of the pipeline could read or write Parquet, so that's kind of fun. Um, and then, as you saw before, it's a relatively small amount of data, and Parquet, you could argue, is not really necessary here. And um, the rewrite process ran into this problem with field inconsistencies. The Stinger project is under active development. And so what that means for us is that we are getting like this schema migration. So, um, and it's, it's kind of like unknown to us when this is gonna happen. We don't have a lot of insight into what the architects of Stinger are doing. And so we might end up seeing brand new fields that we had no idea were gonna be there. And we might lose fields that we thought uh, we're usually going to be there. And then these five minute processes um, were apparently a pain. They were running into each other. And so this caused some kind of complicated renaming schema that didn't sound like a lot of fun to have to deal with. And I would kind of argue that a lot of this points to a solution that was already there that we then took our problem and like fit it to, which is maybe not really the ideal way to work. As I was thinking about the, um, the actual migration and working on this, I thought, above, I thought of some more problems. Um, if you'll recall, the initial pipeline had those really detailed timestamps on the file name, and I do understand the idea, which was to make sure that analysts could just pull the subset of data that they needed. Um, but it didn't really make a lot of sense to me because Spark is really good at filtering out data. So why not just have like a less detailed timestamp and then let Spark do the filtering once the user has read in that data? And then um, all of that processing and aggregation was being handled by Spark, which is great, but again, going into this project, I knew it wasn't a lot of data, and I knew that we didn't need to do terribly heavy processing on it. So it did seem like a bit of a heavyweight solution when perhaps we could get away with something that was much more lightweight. So that was a big question coming into this project, and uh, we did decide to try something more lightweight and you know, if it didn't work out, we could always pull it back, think a bit more about the problem, and potentially go with Spark if we needed it. So the initial architectural decisions that we made, um, I'm gonna go through. For log ingestion, we decided to stick with file beats and log stash. That was working great, and there was no reason to redo that. 
So all we really had to do was just repoint the logs to the cloud where we had set up an Azure event hub uh, for PubSub. The event hub sent the data along to an Azure function. So the function was written in Python and was just intended to do the minor field extraction and processing that we needed, and then write the process logs out to blob storage. We decided to use the premium plan uh, for our Azure function because of the networking that, uh, there were some networking issues that we wanted to avoid. But this also had the added benefit of giving us pre-warmed instances so that we didn't have to worry about the cold start problem, which is very helpful. For the storage phase, we decided to go with data lake storage, partly because it's inexpensive and partly because there just wasn't really a use case for structuring the data, specifically with the schema shift over time. Um, and we also didn't really see a need to be able to run SQL queries against the data. So data lake storage for this project seemed pretty reasonable. And we did decide to store the data in JSON as opposed to Parquet. Um, again, it's a small amount of data. Parquet is not super necessary. And with the changing schema, um, it's really nice to be able to go back to our raw data, be able to look at the like, human readable files and see what's there and what's not. And again, it just made it easier in general to deal with these field inconsistencies. And then for our analytics solution, we decided to go with Azure Databricks. Um, so our analysts would get both Spark access as well as a nice notebook solution and all the fun things that Databricks gives you beside. So for the initial cloud architecture, Everything before Logsash still looks the same. We still have Stinger sending logs to file beats where they get forwarded to Logsash. And then Logsash sent them on to our event hub. The event hub sent the logs to our function, which again just did the minor processing, cleaning, and then wrote the data out to blob storage. And from there, the data was available to our uh, users, to our analysts and data scientists via Databricks, which was hooked up to the storage account. And for the, those daily aggregations that we needed to run, we just set up a pretty simple uh, Python job running in our data workflow management solution, which is Prefect. So this was the initial stab at updating the pipeline and migrating it. And it worked really well. Um, the function was apparently the right solution. Uh, lightweight, didn't have any trouble handling the data that we were sending it. However, there were some complications that uh, led us to rethink the pipeline just a bit and do some tweaking. We weren't able to do any tuning between the pub sub and function layer, and we were getting lots of really small batches of logs. This ended, this led us to end up with lots of really small files and blob storage, which obviously that's problematic. And that meant that both for the purposes of reading into Spark, as well as as daily aggregations that we were running, it was just really slow to read and process what was there. So not ideal. My first thought was to, well, just maybe just try like writing to an append blob instead of to normal blobs. And it seemed like a great idea. Unfortunately, it didn't work, at least at the time that I was working on this pipeline, Spark couldn't read append blobs. And so this was the point where we said, all right, we're gonna have to really rethink this. So we came up with an updated architecture and I need to shout out my colleagues, Drew and Sean, for thinking this through with me. 
we kept everything on the ends the same. So everything from the event hub forward and from the storage account beyond was exactly the same. But in the middle, we made some updates. So the event hub forwarded the data onto a function. And that was function number one. So that function went ahead and did all of the processing that we needed. But instead of trying to immediately write it out to a file name uh, or to a file with a timestamp file name, we wrote everything to one file per minute, kind of like the original pipeline. So right now, all of the logs that uh, are coming into function one are being processed and written to a file that is timestamped to 1152. Again, that's regardless of when the log was actually generated. And then we set up a 10 minute process that would come in, grab the logs that had already been written out and again, already processed, and then break them up according to the timestamp where they needed to go to live permanently. And this architecture has been super seamless and really nice for us. Um, one thing that we did with function two is make sure that there was a solid look back on these 10 minute processes so that we wouldn't get any kind of collision between function, num function one and function two. I wanna give you a little bit more detail about these functions before we move on. So function one essentially does everything that needs to happen to the log. It does all the processing, field extractions, a bit of minor cleanup. And one important thing that it does is to take a look at the logged timestamp and go ahead and parse it and append just a bit of information to each log about what we want its file name to look like. And I'm throwing some code up here. Um, definitely not to say that it's exciting code. In fact, it's pretty boring. But this is sort of the bulk of what happens to each log. Basically, we decode it, we grab the JSON, we do that timestamp parsing so that we know where to write it, and then we're good to go. There is another step that happens after this where some of the field extractions or dropping fields we don't need happens, but again, like this is all that we really need to do for the most part, and I'm throwing it up here to say that I think that we made the right choice in using a function as opposed to just trying to get a Spark infrastructure set up and do any kind of crazy streaming there. Now function two, again, doesn't have to do any processing. All of that is already done. All it has to do is look at the file name that we've appended and break up the data that it sees according to that. And so it writes out the final files and we decided in the end to make a concession to the original architects of the pipeline and keep part of a file name or part of the um, timestamp down to the hour level, uh, but no more five minute level. That seems a little, it was definitely excessive. This new pipeline has been significantly more stable as my data scientist has told me on a number of occasions. And pipeline hiccups have been really rare. I can only think of two examples where we had in the last year where we've had some kind of issue with it. And the offshoot of that is that our data scientists really trust that the data is accurate and up to date. And that trust is really important. Of course, pipeline hiccups do happen, um, sometimes self-inflicted, unfortunately. And the, again, another uh, advantage of this architecture is that we've had really straightforward recovery from the hiccups. Uh, basically just have to send the logs on again from Logstash and everything, the event hub, the functions, just like takes care of it seamlessly. And then we haven't had to worry about pipeline collisions either. If you'll recall, that was a problem with the original pipeline. Um, I would argue that the Spark processes were just too much heavy lifting when we needed a lighter weight approach. And uh, even the 10 minute processes, 
I've never had a problem with them running into each other, even when I've piped significantly more, in fact, orders of magnitude more data into them. They still finish really fast because it's just a very lightweight uh, body of code that's being run against them. And then this more flexible architecture that we've gotten uh, has lent itself to many more use case possibilities. The data scientist who is uh, essentially in charge of the analytics and ML on this project has come to me um, on quite a few occasions in the last even just six months asking for, um, for different aggregations, for uh, augmentation of the base data, as well as new external jobs relying on the data that we have. And I think that's really cool. The new pipeline also uh, had some enhancements that were really great over the original one. The Databricks layer is really nice because it's, it was a lot more flexible than our in-house Jupyter Notebook solution originally was. It's given our analysts a much easier way to do ad hoc augmentation of base data, as well as integration with external packages and tooling, specifically because of the better networking in Databricks and uh, Azure than what we had set up originally on premises. We also are really pleased with the GitLab integration that we worked on. Um, the CI CD definition integrated with function templates meant that it was just really easy to develop and test. We set up our dev branch so that uh, code pushed to dev went to a test function where we could do the testing we need and make sure that things were looking promising. And then the main branch deployed our code to the production function. And of course, these definitions are extremely reusable, which is great because we did end up using them for the next series of pipelines that we migrated. All of the components lived in a dedicated virtual cloud network, which is great because it made um, access control really easy. We were peered to Duke's network, and we get from the cloud multiple levels of access control which is really helpful. Um, we have a number of interns cycling through uh, the, specifically my data analytics team, and it's very easy to both uh, grant and revoke accesses, access permissions, that is. When I think about the advantages of the move to the cloud, I, I would probably sum them up by saying that it gave us the ability to fit the solution exactly to what the problem was and not vice versa. The flexibility was really awesome. As you saw, we were able to add components pretty seamlessly to this pipeline when we realized that it wasn't exactly what we needed. And then scale and compute on the fly when we need it. The fine-grained authentication controls that I already mentioned. And then an on-demand Spark cluster in Databricks for where we actually need it, the analytics and ML side, and not where we don't in that base level processing. And then I would argue that we just got all of the appropriate tooling, things that we were just not going to have on premises. So PubSub and the lightweight serverless compute, again, I think it was exactly the right way to solve this problem. And then Databricks for all of the analytics and ML needs after the fact, once the data was already prepped. I love this quote um, that my data scientist uh, my data scientist said this a few weeks ago, and I was really excited because I felt like it indicated sort of like the best possible outcome of a project like this. Uh, she trusts the pipeline, she's excited about the project again, and she's coming to me and asking me to do more things to uh, help her with her analyses. I wanted to sum up the lessons that we learned over the course of this project. 
I would say the first big one was that you really shouldn't blindly replicate the, in, the existing infrastructure, as tempting as it might be. Obviously, we could handle the cleaning and processing phase without Spark. And things like this very specific file name on the timestamp was really unnecessary. It added overhead to the project. And Parquet, at least for this project, just wasn't necessary. In particular, using JSON was advantageous because of the migrating schema on the data. On the flip side of that, one lesson that we learned is that you shouldn't discount the existing ideas just because they're already there. And if you'll recall, we did eventually uh, go back to that two-prong solution for prepping our data and getting it ready for our, our data scientists, obviously with some updates. Data from the pipeline that we migrated is now being used for machine learning on attack trends, long-term analysis and reporting, and most importantly, information sharing among our partner universities. And we took everything that we learned over the course of this project and applied it to a harder problem, a new pipeline or another pipeline that we needed to migrate that was intended to be used for near, near real-time DNS processing. So that pipeline had significantly higher throughput, uh, 16 and a half gigabytes of compressed data per day, and we used Parquet format for that. As well as lower latency, we needed our analysts to be able to access the logs within five to 10 minutes of uh, ingest. And this is another pipeline that is now running, is super seamless, and um, was actually pretty quick to set up because of everything that we'd learned. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>